sleeper! Look at this! It's a lion salt! Wrestling is the what everybody wants to see. Tony is a legendary promoter. People don't really understand what was going on up here. Tony was like a feeding system almost with all the guys he had. He just suplexed them outside the ring. And that's pretty amazing for a company out of Winnipeg. It's a great story. Promoter Tony Canelo is here! As a promoter, he's gotta go through me. That's all the people need to know. Hi, everybody. Hope you're ready for another hour of action-packed wrestling excitement here on WFWA Main Event Wrestling Joyello live outside the Pony Corral here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. We have got an action-packed hour coming up. As a promoter, they have a contract with me, and I don't want no drugs, no alcohol, respect the premise that we go, to not touch anything or take does not belong to you. Those are my rules, by contract, verbally, the way you want to say it. If they break those rules, simple, I leave them here. They have broken the contract, and I don't pay them, simple. My job is as a promoter and the booker, but once they, they realize what the cost is, and once they realize who they want to see, I phone the wrestler, whatever it might be, mostly 95% from the United States. I'll make a deal with them to fit in the price that I'm going to get from the reservation, like a Deer Lake. And uh, it takes a long time. It takes approximately two months to set it up. too much, don't you? But anyway, I was born in 1942, August the 8th. Where, where, though? Can you add it all in? I was born in... Oh, I see. Okay, let's start all over again. Yeah. You ask me what year I was born. Yeah, I said, and where? You didn't say where. I... Very first word. You can't where? read. Hospital. Okay. Yeah. Start all over again. Ask me again. I was born in Calabria, Italy, uh, Bovolino Marina, uh, 1942, August the 8th. Arrived in Canada in 1953. It was only yesterday, but it was 1953. Well, the uh, first house that uh, I lived on is, uh, was on uh, 238 Manitoba Street, just off uh, Main. In the North End, I stayed about a year, I guess, and then we moved, uh, yeah, f just f right off. Hello? Hello? From the elder, Italian uh, people says, hey, Tony, if somebody calls you a DP or a WAP, just smash him. And I did. Now, of course, I got my lumps and so forth. And to get better through the fighting game, and I figured, you know what? I'm going to learn to be a wrestler and I'll fix everyone up. Yeah, I was about 14 years old and I started actually at the amateur wrestling at the YMCA in Winnipeg here. We went to school there for about approximately three years. And uh, actually, one of the greatest teachers I ever had was Al Alfred Wurr, uh, which is in the uh, Hall of Fame in uh, amateur uh, uh, wrestling books. And he told me, Tony, when you put me off balance, then you're learning. He took me about a, uh, believe me, about a year before I put that guy off balance. I got into the professional wrestling world, uh, age 17 actually. Uh, my first match was in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, I did not go there to wrestle actually. The local wrestlers uh, said, Tony, why don't you come for a ride to Minneapolis? And uh, 
to watch wrestling, that is. And when I got there, uh, Wally Carbo and Vern Gagne, which uh, they represent the American Wrestling Alliance, AWA, uh, while I was there, they said, hey, kid, do you want to... You want to make $75? I said, do what? Wrestle. They put me in that ring with, uh, I'm telling you, six foot four, uh, one of the top villains they had, and wrestled the guy. Of course, he beat me. Jim Trivenoff, he was the wrestling commission those days for the amateur and professional. He see me on television and uh, took away my uh, amateur card away from me. And he says, kid, uh, if you want your amateur card back, as an amateur, you're going to wait five years. Well, you know, you're 17 years old, you're not going to wait no five years. And, uh, of course, I lost my amateur statics, and the AWA told me, he says, uh, put some pounds, and we could use a letter on, which I did. And uh, that time I weighed maybe 150 pounds, and put on about 50 pounds in a year and a half, and I wrestled for them after that for part, approximately 12 years on the road. Back in the, in the 60s, became the flying Italian with my partner, uh, Guy Vinci. We were one of the top tag teams, uh, middleweights you know, across the country. Uh, we were tag team champions, and uh, uh, then, of course, uh, I, I do remember I was a single champion, he was a single champion, and he, you know, he kept going down the ladder. They needed three planes, three planes to, to fly to Deer Lake. I wonder why, it was too much weight. You're taping or what? Yeah, want to wave? Right? Hey? Want to say hello to your family and friends? Yeah, hello everybody. Let me tell you guys, if this plane goes down, I will say hello and goodbye to your friends. <laughs> hey, Tony. Today is July 1st, big celebration here at Deer Lake, and in a, I would say about four hours from now, see this location here, it'd be completely sold out. So we're here to entertain the people, have fun, and make everybody happy. Then we drive back to Winnipeg where I'm from, and the rest of the rest of go where they're from. Simple as that. You know, I've been working with Tony since probably about 1999, and. Uh, not, not only in this area, but around the world, Tony is a legendary promoter. And, uh, you know, notwithstanding, Tony's also a great guy, so it makes it easy to come back and work for him. Uh, I definitely would uh, consider doing this again with Tony. Um, he seems like a great crew he brings out every time. Uh, I actually went to, I was doing a job out in uh, Little Grand Rapids, and he was doing a show out there at the same time, so I went to go watch him, and his crew at the time seemed, to, seemed pretty good too, so. It would be good to come back with Tony. Back in 1971, I was uh, 27 years old, and um, I always wanted to be a, become a wrestler. That was one of my goals, my dreams of uh, when I was a young, young person raised on a farm. And then I seen that ad in the newspaper that Tony Candelo had a school for wrestling in Winnipeg, so I said, here's my chance to, uh, to become a wrestler. Yeah, the, the, the intention of me opening up that school was to start my own business, really. That's, that was the intention. So uh, I figure if I teach a bunch, you know, a bunch of guys to, so I can get a, a team going, and I was thinking of opening up my own promotion. Well, the first school that I opened was on Donald Street, uh, just downtown Winnipeg here. After that, and open up with a, a different location, which was Corridor and Waterloo. That's in the basement of one of my beauty salons. As you must know that I actually by trade, as I, I'm a hairstylist, really. So I had a full basement there, and I figured, you know what, put a ring here. It doesn't cost me any more money for rent. And, and a lot, a lot of people came from, from that basement. I'll tell you, a lot of wrestlers, good wrestlers, they came out of there. Well, our training consists of uh, at least three times a week, right through the year, summer and winter, for almost two years of hard, 
hard rock training to, uh, so I could accomplish my goals and dreams. It was the first school in North America open to the public uh, to become a professional wrestler, it was me. Uh, he was a nice guy. He, was, uh, he wanted to accomplish his dream uh, to become a local promoter and to promote wrestling all over Manitoba. And he was very selective to the guys that he could have in his roster. So we had to follow what, uh, what he wanted done because Tony's been wrestling for many, many years before, prior to that. So he had the knowledge of wrestling. At that time, I had about 50 students under my belt and uh, uh, I taught them. Scotty Campbell started. One I really uh, remember is uh, Roddy Piper. He was a 17-year-old kid at that time and I must say, they only paid me $10 down payment for the classes, which was $40 a month those days. And I never seen another dime after that. <laughs> but uh, he, he had a lot of talent, and I knew very well that one of these days he'll become a big superstar. And he did. Of course, another guy I have to mention that uh, uh, became really good is the, his real name is Fred Peloquin from Winnipeg here. Uh, I created the guy. I give. Uh, I gave him a new hairstyle, uh, he still has it today. He's bald and he had a beard and I called him the French Mad Dog. It made me become the character of the style and the look that I wanted to be and he fi finally Tony, with it, through his uh, barbershop, he shaved my head and cut my beard and I looked like a vicious French Mad Dog and that's what I did and nobody stopped me from being that all the way through in my career as a pro wrestler. I'm gonna promise you one thing, I'm gonna get the job done. My first promotional card that I did with the students that I had uh, was uh, 1973, June 5th. And they happened at 150 River Avenue in Winnipeg here. Uh, actually, I remember exactly how many people I drew. 1,236, that was pretty good for those days. That's the first match all the uh, students from his school uh, performed on that match that night, yes. And uh, that's where Fred Peliquin, the French Mad Dog, he wrestled that night, and uh, Rod Piper wrestled that night, he was on the card, and many other local guys that I had. That was the first promotion, uh, repeated again, 1973, June 5th. And that was Roddy Piper's first match ever, professionally in which I'm the guy that wrestled against him and uh, beat the hell out of him too. <laughs> well, back in that time here in the AWA, that was the major league. You know, WWF was in the north, but they were starting to make their way through inroads here as well. And they were becoming the, the big company at that point. You still had uh, NWA slash WCW, call it what you will. They had the other big stars. So when Tony broke free and put his own together, you basically, perception is you're going to start as like uh, if you were using a sports analogy, you went from uh, major leagues to, let's say, the AAA franchise. From uh, that promotion that uh, Tony had put together, we were hitting a lot of small towns around Manitoba to get more experience, more knowledge in the wrestling ring. I became a full-time promoter now, and uh, instead of uh, two matches uh, every month or whatever, I used to produce the maximum 150 different events a year. So it was full-time basis here and uh, slowly, slowly I pulled away from the hairstyling business and started promoting wrestling, really. We grew big because we're going to every town in Manitoba and we're drawing people, they were all coming out of the bushes. There was places of 2,000 people, uh, 1,000 people uh, a couple of times a week who were drawing all the big towns in Manitoba. But back then, when he first started, I mean, that's a tough sled. You, you're the local guy. I mean, some of these guys worked full-time jobs here, so people knew them as their buddies. And when you become and get that perception, you're trying to, you know, cut your teeth. In a, a, you're swimming with sharks now. And Tony seemed to manage to do it. I mean, I had a great time just as a Winnipegger getting to tour through Manitoba, Saskatchewan, parts of Ontario. It was fun. It was fantastic. Portage La Prairie, Brandon... The Paw, uh, Flint Flon, uh, uh, so many towns, you know, every town that I've been to in Manitoba, I've been there. Pretty much if there was a hall 
in a town, Tony would book it. Tony, to expand his uh, business, then uh, we decided to start filming that. Some of the guys that were in the show was Bulldog Bob Brown, uh, Kerry Pitbull Brown, uh, the Baron, I believe, uh, Bobby Jones, the French Mad Dog, uh, and so many that I, I had to have their names in front of me to remember them. At, uh, that's where we pick uh, Club Dabu that we're able to get in there and start fil filming and put it on the local TV to prom uh, help us to promote ourselves. He doesn't know where he is right now. Big uppercut by Brunzel. Bulldog Brown, but I think he's scared of the French Mad Dog. We had guys that were uh, local guys that was here and Tony would bring in a few extra guys from Edmonton, Minneapolis, like Benjamin Von Raschke. We had the Bulldog, Barb Brown, Ken Petera came a few times, Chris Markoff. So we're getting a mixture of different people coming in to mix with us local guys to produce that new, new era of uh, television that we're promoting right across uh, Manitoba. You know, Tony had a lot of contacts still because he wrestled in the AWA sometimes as well before he decided he was going to do his own thing. So when you have that network of contacts and those guys start falling off, getting out of the business and everything else, so at one time you're bringing in these legends from, let's say, the American Wrestling Association, well, they still have some value to you because they've never been seen in some of these towns. So you're bringing the stars basically now to the people. Uh, some of the, the bars location that actually I was the first guy to bring wrestling to the bars, believe this or not. Uh, some of the bar with Georgie's on Porridge Avenue, we used to tape there for uh, actually Club Taboo, which is kind of the inn on uh, McPhillip, Pandora Hotel and, and so forth, so forth. But that's, that's some of the names that uh, we used to tape it for television. Off the ropes coming! Fly a drop kick! Oh! Nails him over the top rope! But I always loved the vibe that we used to get in some of the nightclubs. The lighting was there, it was a dark room, and it was a whole different idea than what the big boys were doing, like the WWF at the time. And the old arena, like for the AWA, you couldn't compete, you couldn't sell that many tickets. But for 200, maybe three or 400 people on a real big night in some of those clubs with the two tiers, and you could have yourself a beer, a cold beer, and watch some guys really duking it out sometimes to just try and get a break. And when you're that close to the action, they're laying them in there. I'll tell you, it was a good time. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another week with the WFWA. Joy Ello here at ringside with Bulldog Bob Brown and some exciting wrestling action coming up. Bulldog, a tag team spectacular. Tonight. Well, you know, today that we're going to see just how tough Baron Von Rushke is. And the Baron is going to have a partner which he needs to protect him. Now, they're going to go against Eddie Watts and Kerry Pitbull Brown. Now, we're going to see a little finesse in this match because the Baron won a competition. He's going to get it. The month of November, one you'll never Look forget. at that. 480 pound dropkick. My, I, I just can't believe the things that he does. Oh, I can't believe it, and I can't believe this. Trying to sever the neck right off of the tulip with that bottom rope strand. And look at the face of Kamala. He's enjoying himself. There you see one of the toughest maneuvers to get out, and I can't believe it. The dog unhooked the leg on that figure four leg lock. And the dog is trying to regain some blood in that leg so he can get back up on his feet. This has been action. When you put two veterans in the ring, all you get is a war, a war, a war. And this is what this match is going to be. All right, the Baron, he didn't fall for it, Bob, and I'm glad he did it. And he knows where the Sheik at, and I know Casey's filming. The Sheik's running around there like a chicken with his head cut off. But he seems to have extra power. There we go, the collision on the 409 head on traffic. And the Baron and the dog is still holding on to that leg, a lot of pain. There it is. The Baron has got the claw on Hunt the Betty Watts. All right. You haven't stepped in the ring with Baron Von Raska. My fangs are sharp. My claw is sharp. And I'm ready to chew.
And I'll tell you what, Terry Brown, I'm going to chew on you. That's all the people need to know. All right, Baron Von Raschke. So and what happened then was he developed his own local stars um, and found some other diamonds in the rough in Canada and brought in a few veterans from the States, like a Jimmy Brunzel or a Baron Von Raschke. Uh, at some times you had big names like Rick the Model Martel, uh, Canadian. Uh, Ken Patera. I mean, we even brought in legends like Gene Kaniski, um, and even had Nick Bockwinkle come in. Singles action here in just a second, but ladies and gentlemen, the man you see in your television sets, former AWA heavyweight champion Nick Bockwinkle. Nick, I know it's been a long time coming up here in Canada. No, but I, I've always enjoyed it. I, mean, I lived up here a couple of times, and uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to come back. Joe Yellow, we're talking about one of the greatest guys that I ever met, that he is still today. The way I met him, I do recall that uh, one of my employees, uh, she's having a social. Uh, she's getting married, and she says, Tony, uh, need your help maybe bring some of the some of the rest to be security. So I did. I go up to these guys and there's gruff Tony, right? And I said, hey, Mr. Candelo, uh, my name's Joe Aiello and I know this about wrestling and I know that about wrestling, like I had all the answers. Uh, I sure would like to be uh, a wrestling announcer and I like to learn and I'll give you 100%, he says to me. And I say, yeah, yeah, okay, kid, and I'll talk to you later. Just started out doing a mail segment, that kind of thing on, uh, on the air, because back then there was no email. It was uh, hardcore mail. I started looking at this guy and says, yeah, he's not too bad for the first time, right? So we kept going. That was, that was his first start. And um, keep working with the guy for many, many years. And Tony gave me a shot to just uh, just because I was probably driving him nuts, <laughs> asking him. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of WFWA Main Event Wrestling. Joe Aiello here with you to carry you through the next 60 minutes. We've got plenty of great action coming up. We'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Just I went from doing the stand-up stuff and just shilling the towns on, on when the shows were coming up to doing some of the play-by-play, -play, which I really had fun with because as much as wrestling, they'll tell you, is predetermined and everything, it was still live to tape for me, watching the play-by-play -play develop and the storylines. So they gave me this great foil in this iconic Manitoba figure who made it worldwide in Bulldog Bob Brown. And Joe, you know, even though that it's about a couple of weeks ago, you seem to be enthused. It's about some time that you get some energy in that body and look a little intelligent for the television people. Hey, I got to say this, you're really up for it today. All right, we've got plenty of great wrestling action coming up. So Bob and I, I mean, he was the old cranky codger and I was the young whippersnapper in his eyes. And I don't know, we just had this pretty good vibe together and... You know, he would, uh, he would always get cranky and, and tell everybody this and that to the viewing audience, and it would be my job to get him back and reel him back in to reality. And, yeah, I'd take shots at him every once in a while, and sometimes they'd be over his head. And it was just a neat little uh, routine we developed. And you know what? Had nothing but respect for Bulldog just because I was a young kid, and I knew who he was, and he really didn't have to give me the time of day. And... Uh, we had some good times. God rest his soul, because he was a character. Now, do you call that justice, Joe? No. What are they going to do about it? Uh, how are we going to have another champion? Do you know anything? Well, before you put your foot in your mouth any further, I might as well tell you and the great fans at home that promoter Tony Candelo and the WFWA that was a, champion. a team that I never, never forget. Bulldog Bob Brown was one of a type. Uh, he was from the old school and uh, always rough and tough and... Even Bulldog Bob Brown as a wrestler was one of the toughest guys I ever met in that ring. Uh, anyway, it became a great combination between Bulldog Bob Brown and Joe Yellow, a villain and a good guy. They made a great show. What if those two were the last men left in the ring? What do you mean, maybe Bulldog Bob Brown? Now, that's what you call people with brains. Now, this is what I call, it's all even now. This is good. Joe is a wrestling guy. You know, he's not, he's not a television announcer who is hired to announce wrestling. He is a wrestling fan. He was, is, and always will be. 
Paradise going to work now. Going for a pin. Might be a little too early for that. Two and a half. He might have. Whoa. Freeze. He almost had the freeze. We look back at the old tapes and there was a lot of shtick. And, oh, Tony, I'll tell you. You know, but that was Joe. And that's, that's what was great. I mean, it was a combination of the old AWA with a lot of the modern stuff. You know, I know there, there are people out there in the industry that, that think that, you know, they're very cliche and classic and it was boring. It wasn't boring. It was fantastic TV. And Joe was the old school wrestling announcer with the modern twist. And I mean, uh, he got the storyline across. He, del he got the message across that the guys in the ring were trying to get across. He helped it out. Hey, well, you f off. I'm doing an interview for you. <laughs> yeah, it's Ayalo. Who do you think this is? Yeah, I gotta finish the interview though. He's asking me all the questions. I'll talk to you later. Bye. He's, he's laughing. You know, Tony. Oh, yeah. That character in himself. So we have a great show for you. Remember, boys and girls, stay away from the ring. We don't want anybody to get hurt. And as you know, look at me. Well, uh, we've always known Tony, like I said, we've always known him and uh, we know what kind of entertainment he puts on, so we called him up and uh, sure enough, he's here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, at 215 pounds, First Nation, from Red Valley, Arizona, he is Shadow Extreme. You're gonna get Pearl Harbor from behind. But let's not talk about the natural right now. Let's talk about the guy. Don't Callis, I guess he answered my uh, one of my ads. Of, you know, if you want to become a professional wrestler, give me a call. Blah blah blah. Look at the guy, and you know, he figured he's got good, good personnel to be a wrestler. And so I took him on, right? It took me seven years uh, teaching uh, the ropes to Don Callis, and. Uh, Every time I had a name known through the wrestling fans, I booked Don Callis against them. So it became a name through television and through the wrestling world here in Manitoba. I'll have you know, promoter Tony Condello has informed me you will face none other than Rick the Model Martel. What? You will be facing Rick the Model Martel. Rick Martel from the World Wrestling Federation. That Rick Martel? Yes. Wait a minute. Rick the Model Martel? Absolutely. The former world champion? That Rick yes. Martel? Rick Martel from the World Wrestling Federation? Yes. Mariani, I can't beat Rick Martel. I mean, I could beat Rick Martel. I could, I could wrestle him. I could do something, but I can't beat him. I could beat him. I could beat him. Mariani. What I seen on Don in those days was that, uh, uh, don't forget, this is one man operation here in the. Yeah, I do the booking, I had to do the, the book the towns and uh, the television. And it was a lot of work for one individual. But what I seen in Don Callis was he had a lot of talent in many different ways. He could wrestle, he could talk, uh, he could uh, uh, book people. He had all kinds of ideas about wrestling. Uh, so I figured, you know what, let the kid do this. It will take a load off my shoulder. And uh, he did. That's why, be, like I said, that's why he, he was an announcer with Joy Yellow. He, he was a booker. He was a wrestler. Because he had all those, that talent that, to do it. So he took a lot of weight off my shoulder. So that's why I let him do it. Including tag team action coming up in. All right, Ayala, look, I know you know where Brunzel is. I don't care about a tag right now, that the tag is going to happen. And I'm going to go in there, and whoever it is is going to get one of these because I'm not a happy man. And I know at some you know point, you got to give your star the time on television outside of just wrestling. And that's basically what happened. And he took such a big role in basically writing and producing some of that show from behind the scenes. Session with legendary superstar Maurice Mad Dog Vachon. Don't you dare miss it. There you have it, Joe Aiello. He's almost as good as the natural. No bones about it, Don was very, very talented in the ring. Uh, he idolized Ric Flair, and what better person to idolize, especially when you can do everything that Ric Flair did in his heyday and did it as well as he did. Don was running a lot of the show stuff, and I think that's part of the reason why this whole IWA thing transformed, because 
The guys that were coming in now were all young like Don. And these guys were going somewhere. So this was a great training ground. I mean, Chris Jericho, local kid, went to Calgary, trained. Lance Storm, wow, amazing athlete. Uh, you'd see Lenny St. Clair come in as Dr. Luther later on in his career, but even uh, the edges of the world. And I don't know if there's a lot of footage of Christian when he uh, did some stuff here. You know, and that's the thing, like those guys, a lot of them became superstars. Some of them became well-known worldwide. And that's pretty amazing for a company out of Winnipeg run by an Italian guy that basically, you know, was a hairdresser for a living that wrestled and decided to open up his own company. Never got rich from it, but a lot of guys did by gaining experience here. I just, it's a great story. And I'm glad that I was a little part of it, just being a Winnipeg kid. Timing was everything, really. First time that I seen Chris Jericho wrestle was uh, again a club taboo, the uh, kind of the end. That was his first match there. The, I can't recall the year, but uh, I knew very well from that moment on. This kid has a lot of talent. Uh, you know, the blonde hair, long blonde hair, and so forth. The color, the way he wrestled, the way he talked. Uh, great interviews. That one of these days he's going to hit big, and he did. Uh, like I said, I can tell a mile away if you have that type of talent. It was kind of this unknown thing out here because, like I said, it was pre-internet. Um, so nobody really knew that this thing out here existed. You know, this company with, like, Jerry Morrow and the Great Gamma and Johnny Smith and, like I said, Ultima Dragon and Jericho and Lance Storm. I mean, that, it's a ridiculous roster. I mean, it's so chock full of, you know, future world champions in this industry. I met a guy named uh, Carl DeMarco which he was the uh, front man as a promoter for Vince McMahon, WWF at that time. I had a meeting with him, and he knew that I was a promoter in Manitoba and Ontario. And he introduced me, uh, Adam Copeland and uh, Christian. Carl DeMarco, who was the, the head of the Canadian office, um, I had done some you know, small shows in and around Ontario and had come in contact with him. Carl DeMarco asked me to uh, give them all the work possible as far as wrestling and no favors for them. Put them right through the grinder. There was, there was no farm system then. There was no FCW to, to go and learn the WWE way or anything like that. So, you know, he just said, go out and get experience. And then, you know, from being in contact with us and everything and, and then getting in contact with Tony, it was like, cool, I can send guys out there to get experience. Remember the name, it's going to be around for a while. So each six months I report back to Vince McMahon and Carl DeMarco how these two kids are doing. Because Carl really looked after the Canadian guys and, and wanted Canadian guys to make inroads. And, you know, he could send a whole batch of guys out, out to Tony and, uh, you know, just get experience. I was uh, trying to give as much booking as possible and really uh, get them to shape as far as attitude and everything else because they had some ideas for them and Vince McMahon ideas worked. It was a good proving ground for people to, uh, it, it quickly weeded out the, uh, the ones who really wanted it as opposed to ones who thought it would be a cool, you know, job on the weekends. And these new up and coming stars, well, You'd have to talk to them. I'm just going on economics here. A lot cheaper to bring in these young guys, and the model might have been the philosophy, anyway, not Rick Martel, but the model of the business might have been you can save money on talent now, but develop your own stars. Edge or Adam Copeland as a wrestler, phenomenal. Um, I mean, I was in no way, uh, you know, in those days I was still fairly green. I wasn't a, a judge of who was good or who wasn't, but without question, uh, he was phenomenal in the ring. You know, I think Tony, you know, saw a bunch of young, hungry kids and, and didn't just bring us out for that, he brought us out for his TVs too, which was, you know, for we hadn't done TV yet. Like at one time, Tony was like a feeding system almost with all the guys he had because he had regular dates. So a lot of guys wanted to come here just to gain experience. And the one key that Tony had that a lot of these other Canadian companies didn't, television. And what did these guys want? They wanted their face on television so they could use that on their resume. It's amazing, but this was all before social media and everything else, right? And that was the key. 
And Tony could give them that. We can get a TV quality match with camera angles, with, with commentary, with all of these things. That's just going to, you know, we can send that out to other promoters down in the States or um, wherever. Well, Joe Ace, you had to grow up tough if you came from the Bronx, but Adam Impact, holy cow, look at that move, head scissors, takedown. And this match already up and running some great excitement going here. Irish Rick with our reversal now. Ace meets the turnbuckle and Impact with the crossbody. Because of, uh, number one, television, yeah. Uh, that's why the... Uh, they wanted to be on the television, so they get the exposure. After you get the exposure through television, you, can, you know, if you're really good, if you're a main event or whatever, a main event, you can wrestle play anywhere. And that's what a wrestler wants. Television is a strong thing to have. And that's why Vince McMahon is on top of the world. He's got the power of television. We had some amazing talent that had come in for us. I think we were the first promotion in Canada to bring in the Ultimo Dragon. In those days was a fantastic, uh, world-renowned Japanese wrestler who made his name in WCW and, and WWF and WWE after that, whatever you want to call it. You know, we were drawing because people followed our program every week on TV. And we would tour a lot rurally in Manitoba. And we were getting really good houses because, you know, we had that following. Um, I mean, it, it, it was a great time to be in the wrestling business. If you look back at that crew, you could put it on WWE TV today. That's how good it was. And um, I don't know if I've ever known of an, uh, another promotion that had that, you know, that group of people that would go on to do what they did. Corner, but it hasn't hurt them a bit because look at Jericho. He is on fire and so is GT Cruz who's recuperated. And they got both men on the run and I hope that Lenny and Cruz do something soon. They turn that one around there. Holy cow, look at this one. Both of them reverse it one more time. And whole atomic drops there and both of them outside the ring. And this one, all oh, just what I expected might happen has happened. We've got all four of them outside the ring. Well, why is it the referee disqualified Chi Chi Cruz for coming in? Jericho's a legal man with Lenny St. Clair. Lenny St. Clair and Brian Jewell were trying to have a wrestling match. And the other team, Jericho and Cruz, has turned it into a brawl. And they are going all the way live. And why does not the referee disqualify Chi Chi Cruz? Well, I'll tell you what, the referee had the count on, but we got to be close. And the bell has been rung. The referee has counted, I would think, both teams out from what we can see so far until we get his official decision. But look at this, you've got Cruz and Jewel on one side, and on the other side, you can't see him in your television set. Here we go. You've got Lenny St. Clair with Sunday. He's got a table for crying oh, out loud. My God, I'm Joe, my God, he's going to use a table. And this is the Japanese influence on Lenny St. Clair. Look at him. He's a sick man. He's a twisted man. But look in the ring because T.G. Cruz and Brian Jewell are still going out. He hit him with a table. He threw it at him for crying out loud. I'll tell you what, nothing's safe in this kind of a match unless it's bolted down. And I even have to wonder about that. Absolutely. Look at this. Both men showing some great balance now, holding on to the cage on the top rope beating each other senseless with right hands and lefts both men still on top when will one of them fall over holy cow these two men have been going at it from the get-go in this one look at this natural now oh uh oh martel barely made it he almost hit the pole the natural holy cow holy cow ladies and gentlemen the natural singing soprano that has got to hurt from the top of the cage Listen to this noise. Listen to this crowd, ladies and gentlemen. They have come to life for Rick Martell. Fleet shot, the natural is in some kind of trouble. We're gonna have a new champion. Look, nobody else is gonna get in there in time. Come on, one of you guys has gotta try and get up there. That's a 20-foot steel-high cage from the floor. Look at this! That is sudden impact. Lance Storm from the top of the cage, ladies and gentlemen. I have never seen anybody that high up before. He is coming to help out. Look at this! A crossbody from the top rope. He nails both of them. Holy cow, the natural and bad New Zealand got leveled. But that's it. They're going to work now. And the cage, they finally got it open. Finally, somebody in Lance Storm coming to the aid of his friend. 
and all bedlam breaking loose in this one. Back in 1973, a friend of mine, his name is Phil Fontaine, really, which became later on in life Grand Chief of Canada. He's the one that mentioned to me, Tony, you take wrestling up north. And that's how it came about for me to go into this northern tour because of him. I was one of the first one to be with him on those northern tours. And that's a whole episode by itself. Tony was the first promoter that I am ever aware of that went up north with wrestling. On the winter roads, which is just on ice and across the lakes and everything. And yeah, it was, it was a road to hell, it was as simple as that. In the Northern Tour, uh, they've never seen uh, live wrestling in their lives uh, before, in their reservation, that is, in their own location. So actually, you know, he mentioned to me, just phone him, tell me you were talking to me, and blah, 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 and so forth, and I did. And that's how I get into the, to the, uh, to the North and started doing wrestling. I really enjoyed it, but it was rough, those roads. Growing up and being in the wrestling business, I used to hear about these Northern tours and how horrific they were. When I got there, and they seen those rustlers that they'd never seen before, uh, we were bigger than Hulk Hogan up there, believe me. The real, you know, nitty gritty of it, and really were, were the guys that would get in the van with Tony and would go up north. And it was a select small crew. Because you'd, you'd have the, you know, the Jerichos that would just come in for TVs. We were getting in that van and we were driving north and, and wrestling in these places that you just, you know, it was novel to have blonde hair. You know, we're driving in these 15 passenger vans with 15 passengers, but not 15 normal sized people. We're 15 wrestlers. So a 15 passenger van should really hold about eight wrestlers. Really, it should. We are on the road up there when I do still go, uh, at least three weeks, uh, sometime a month. Uh, that's how long it takes to get there. Don't forget, because the Winter Rose is like a, not uh, like a highway number one. Sometimes you do 15 clicks an hour, 10 clicks, five clicks. Sometimes you get lucky, the, 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 the roads are very well and very good, and you go maybe 30 maximum. So to travel uh, the distance from one reserve to the other, uh, it's maybe 150 clicks, so figure out how long is it going to take you to get to the first one or the second or the third one in, in that period of time, many hours. You can't write driving across a lake and going through it and seeing a man like Rhino, who is, you know, six feet, six one at that point, 325 pounds, crying like a little girl. I mean, and then Tony poking a stick in the hole, going, it, it, okay, it, it'd be fine. I was like, really, it's, it's fine. There's a hole in the lake. How is that fine? That can't be fine, but it was. The travel is just atrocious. I mean, my first northern trip, we drove, I think the first day we drove 14 or 20 hours. I can't remember what it was because, you know, you're, you're just oblivious to time. It stands still. The thing with Tony, I mean, always a cigarette. Always a cigarette you know and we would you know it's minus 72 out it's minus 72 you're not rolling the windows down no but Tony's smoking so you'd be in the smoke box with ice on the inside of the windows one thing with Tony in those vans either it was too hot or too cold Tony didn't have this concept that the heat dial can either be all the way on or all the way off there's a mid-range but it would just you know so guys would be pouring sweat and shivering you know, back and forth and back and forth. And then the smoking, oh man. Tony, I love him to death, but my gosh, all he does is smoke and smoke. Chain smoke in those, in the, in those vans. And you know, you'd say, Tony, Tony, can you put out the cigarette? And you'd hear, shut up, not smoking. Meanwhile, he's smoking. We'd be sitting there driving up on this winter road, just bouncing all over the place in this smoky ice box with Tony telling his story. <laughs> I'm not even going to get into what that means. When you got there, I mean, the conditions we stayed in, I mean, we're not talking the Holiday Inn. We're talking schools, home, and, home ec rooms, sleeping on the gym floors, on blue crash mats or blue gym mats. If you were lucky, you got one of the big, soft, 
blue mats, but you had to claim it. I cannot complain or say anything, say anything about it because they give us the best that they had, uh, the best uh, premises uh, for us to sleep, which was the school gym. We had our own mattress and so forth, but that's all they had. Uh, like I said, the chief and consuls and the people themselves are, they greeted us like uh, you never dream. And sometime, sometime well, well, what's happening, what's happening really, when we used to get there, uh, Chief and Council calls me in, and after 20 hours of driving, that is, says, sorry, Tony, but uh, we had a death in our community and everything is canceled. That's their, you know, that's their, their law, and I respect that, of course. Anyway, in other words, after driving 20 hours, you get there to do the show and you're canceled out. But that's the Norton tour. That's what it's all about. And the problem was you wouldn't know until you got there because you're driving and driving. You know, this is just in the early days of cell phones. There was no cell phone service anywhere you went, and you know there was no way of communicating until you got there and you walked in and the chief or whoever you met said, you know, gee, Tony, I'm sorry, but we had a death this morning, and we have to cancel the show. We would drive to Oxford House and get there, and there'd be a death on the reservation. We'd sit there for two days, and then we'd drive 48 hours somewhere else, and then come back and make up the Oxford House show. And Lance Storm coined it the best by calling it the the, the, the death tour. They named the trip the Debt Tour because of that reason. And it's still today, if you look on the internet, they call Tony Condell's Debt Tour, right? It's funny, but it's not. Phil Fontaine, he right, was a good friend of mine, and Tony says, when you go up there, talk to the kids, stay away from drugs, alcohol, go to school, no gang related, and so forth. You know, back in 1973, I give that guy my word, is if I do go up there, I will say those things, and up to date, i would be keeping my word. I think it's pretty important, like I said, it's providing good quality entertainment for the community. As you can see in the crowd here, it's, it's uh, got quite a, quite a bit of people showed up for this event. I can say that about 2001, that Tony and his uh, wrestling tour has been coming up to uh, our community. It's not just wrestling that they promote. They, they uh, come into our, our, the classrooms and they talk about drugs, about staying in school, stuff like that. Mr. Candelo is, uh, you know, he's been He's been the number one guy that uh, I've been able to, you know, provide my community with, with the quality entertainment that he provides. But it also has instilled motivation and self-determination in the kids back home from wanting to participate in something similar to what Mr. Candelo offers. They always promote a lot of self-awareness and with that self-awareness becomes comes a lot of self-determination as to where you were, where you are now and where you want to be in the future. Let's even up the odds. How about the two of you take on Metalo, Shadow Extreme, and the Canadian legend, Tony Candelo. Hello, I'm wiping his sweat with the flag. The flag. Come on, Tony. Get up here. Come on, Tony. Come on, Tony. What do you want me to do? What? What man? What? 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 What do you want? Put him in a headlock, Tony. Put him in a headlock. How about one of these? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Potatoes. Ty, get up here. All right, what about you? That's it. I never looked at Tony as the promoter. I never did. I always, he was, he was one of us. He was one of the boys, but he was still the office. You know, like we, 
I mean, you never hear of the boys pulling ribs on Vince McMahon or pulling ribs on Vern Gagne. I never had a problem with Tony at all, and we've known each other for so many years, and, and we really enjoy uh, him being the promoter here in Winnipeg. But the guy has a big heart. He's got a soft spot. you got to find it, but if you get into that soft spot, he's putty. He joked around with us, he slept with us, you know, in, on the blue mats, he, he ate the craft dinner with us, you know, and, and all of his uh, quirkiness just added to the point, he's okay, he's one of us, he's in it with us. I think Tony's biggest quirks or things you can call that are unique to him, definitely the smoking, uh, definitely his mustache, definitely the little Indian, hey, look at this, hey, oh my god, hey, stiff, you stiff, yeah. Kill the town. He killed the town on me. We can't come back. <laughs> With his voice too, and it'd be like, and uh, we're going to. Uh, and you go, Winkler? Yeah, that's it. His belly doesn't move. I mean, at that point too, I mean, he's, he's lost weight now. Back then, it was this round, awesome thing. It was just like the Iron Sheiks. It was like, and, and I would poke it. I'd always go up and poke it, and he'd do like this Pillsbury Doughboy, but it was like, the Pillsbury Doughboy after a pack of smokes and a case of beer, it was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's probably one of the most unintentionally funny guys I know because he makes you laugh. He's not trying to, but he just does. He, he, he just does. He makes you laugh. But he's also tough as nails and stubborn. If he thinks something worked 50 years ago in his head today, it still works. And that's okay, because I think we see that in any of our parents. So you get that parental side to him as well. And then you get that whole salesman wrestling promoter side to him as well. He's got so many layers, this guy, right? He probably doesn't even know how many layers. Oh, you're looking for some book? Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. When uh, you were thinking about, you know, the price of the event goes up a bit. He loves to poke people and make them jump and make them char. And it's just, you know, that's his thing. And, and like I say, he's that... He's that lovable, distant uncle that you kind of hope doesn't show up for the big family dinner, but when he does, it's okay. He entertains everybody. He's about as real as it gets. Whether you agree with his opinion or, or not, or how gruff he is, that's Tony. He's not an actor. He's telling you straight up. And yet, if he's telling you a story, there's probably nobody better telling you a story. I do recall one night, and the boys likes to, they like to play ribs on me. Actually, it happened in uh, Garden Hill. <laughs> this tour, Tony was ref, and we were like, Tony, that's it. No, you ref. You, you got to ref it. Uh, I had uh, no, uh, uh, I'll just say, referee uh, material to put on to go in the ring. So I, uh, I had a pair of sweatpants. Someone had put, in, you know, like deep heat in the crotch of the pants before he put them on. They put uh, this stuff inside my uh, sweatpants and inside my, uh, you know, where it hurts a lot. So I'm in the ring, refereeing. Now all of a sudden what happens, <laughs> starting to get hot, really hot. I'm telling a burning sensation you cannot stand. So now he's out in the ring and he's and everybody's at the back watching and he's like fidgeting all squirming everything and, and I'm trying to scratch and trying to hurry up with the match and trying to give a fast three count and it didn't work they're, they're laughing their heads off in a sense and we get to this one spot in the match and money goes ah oh, put me in the corner give me 10 punches cool start giving him 10 punches I step back Lenny walks out does the Ric Flair bump and pants Tony right in the middle of the ring. He came to a point of time there, in some spot or the other, they even pulled my trunks down. And Tony did, and he's got these little jockey briefs on. <laughs> and, then, and then we held on to the pants so he couldn't get the pants back up. As a team, that's what we do. We rib each other. Uh, most of the time, so to, to, I would just say to pass the time away. And that's why I say, like, Tony wasn't a promoter, he was one of us. You, you cannot name another promoter that you could have that fun with. Just, there just isn't. And honestly, he's probably one of the greatest characters I've ever met in my life, and I've met a few over the years in my radio career and even doing some television stuff. But probably I'd say he's a lot softer than people think, and yet, 
one of the toughest guys I've ever met. I've never seen him back down from anybody. He must be the scariest senior citizen out there. So I never really, I never pictured Tony as the promoter. I always pictured Tony as my, my friend Tony. I'm glad for what I did, like I said, because I opened up a lot of doors for a lot of the young, young, young generation uh, to become a superstar. And uh, I'm proud of that, really. Uh, so I think I did something that I wanted to do, and I achieved that. And uh, I brought live wrestling that people never seen it before in their community. That's quite an achievement in 40 years. Phone call came through, sheriff's office. Do you remember? Sheriff. 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 The sheriff. Policeman. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sheriff office. I do recall it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Cat Lake Sheriff. Cat Lake Sheriff. So we, we go to the office. Tony goes, hey, it's Carl DeMarco on the phone. Hey, hey. Carl DeMarco. Oh, it's Carl. Oh, he's the sheriff now. He, no, he he's that? not the sheriff. He's calling the sheriffs. Oh, he's calling the sheriffs. Yeah. Not Omar Sharif. Omar not Sharif. Sharif. Not Sharf. Sharif. So he calls the sheriff's office. You said, hey, we got to go. The Marco he wants to talk to you. And he was with me when I found out that I had my first WWF contract. So Tony was actually standing there, and he knew, too. Bested. And, and he was looking, waiting. and. Uh, so I got the news that, that I was signing a contract, and from there, heading down to Stanford to uh, sign the deal. And uh, one day, I think I jumped over you. In other words, all the hard work, all the complaining, all the pictures <laughs> that we had, going through the ice, and the pig story, whatever you did to Tony Condello, your buddy, your friend, not the promoter, but your friend. I was one of the guys, and still am today. Did. Of all the things that we did, and you went through them, and you took them better than a soldier. By the end, what happened? You paid it off, didn't it? Yep. Peace sure did. Friend. And Tony was there for it. <laughs> that today are we going back <laughs> 20 years already, my God. And we can laugh about it. <laughs> I love how you set everything up like it's a story like it yeah, is. It's, uh, <sighs> no regrets, by all means, at all on my part. And I, uh, well, a few of them, they painted my hair yellow and they did this and did that. But I tell you, I'm still doing it today, actually. You want to come back to Oxford House? No. I don't know why. There you no. Go. <laughs> no, I don't. One. He did it. There it is. <laughs> There's the end of your uh, documentary right there. <laughs>